Our third and last speaker will now zoom to the subject of investment business right away. Dr. Klaus Velashoff is also an ideal guest at our event this evening, now chairman of the board at Velashoff and Partners. Klaus Velashoff was formerly chief economist at the Swiss Bank Corporation and then at UBS. He's also president of the supervisory board of the Institute of Economics at the University of St. Gallen and works pro bono with several foundations and organizations supporting science, culture, and sports. In 2008, Warren Buffett called derivatives financial weapons of mass destruction. Of the quants, those formula-loving number wizards had brought the world to the brink of destruction with their illusionary risk models. Whether we are talking nuclear, digital, or financial weapons of mass destruction, the question remains, what determines at the end of the day whether a devastating catastrophe occurs or not? I launched our series of keynote speakers here with a look at the outbreak of the First World War. I would like to introduce our final speaker with a true fact regarding the danger of weapons of mass destruction during the Cold War. And at the same time, I would like to pay tribute to Stanislav Yevgravovich Petrov. You never heard of him? Yes. Yes. But you owe your, him your life. We all do, provided we were born before September 25, 1983, even though you may not have been aware of this until now. Because in the night of September 25 to 26, 1983, Stanislav Petrov saved the world. And he did it single-handedly, and unlike James oh, Bond, he had no screenplay to count on in which the happy ending is as firmly scheduled as the Amen in the church. On the evening of September 25, Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov was the duty officer of the Soviet Satellite Surveillance Command Center 50 kilometers north of Moscow. Suddenly, all the screens in his bunker started flashing, giving the alarm that a nuclear missile had just been launched from a U.S. base in Montana and was heading towards Moscow. The satellite radar then showed that four more were on their way. Then, at the very latest, he should have followed, followed orders and reported the incident to the top Soviet leadership, who would have retaliated within maximum 28 minutes with their own nuclear missiles against the West. But to comrade Petrov, it didn't really make sense for the Americans to attack with just five missiles. He had a hunch that it might be a technical false alarm. And he knew full well that if he transmitted the alarm to Moscow, this would most likely mean the start of the Third World War and total annihilation. So Lieutenant Colonel Petrov took a decision that changed the world, although it was kept secret for a long time. He listened to his intuition rather than the computers, a decision that could have cost him his neck. He later explained his reason for doing so. After all, we humans are more intelligent than computers because we built them. So that is why in those few fateful minutes, the he told the top Soviet leadership that it was merely a false alarm on the control screens in his bunker, but he didn't know. And the man who saved the world from destruction on the evening of September 25, 1983, and on all the evenings thereafter was right. The Soviet satellites had, been, had wrongly thought that the reflection of sunlight off clouds above the US nuclear bases was a missile attack. After all, we humans are more intelligent than computers because we built them. I'm looking forward to hearing whether our final speaker is, more, speaker is more a fan of intuition and gut feeling or of algorithms and formal models. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him with an explosive round of applause resonating with our confidence that he will tell us how to invest in such a way as not to regret the decision the day after the crash. <laughs> Dr. Velasov, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not in the business of scaring people. These two gentlemen are, apparently. <laughs> but they're for a good reason. And, and in a sense, I will be sharing some of the attitude they have. And I do think the attitude that has been projected to us, and, and, and I 100% would subscribe to it, is that we need to be realistic. And sometimes it hurts and it makes you sick when you look at things. And I, I come from a military family. My father was an admiral. 
and I feel very sick about the German Navy. I'm a German national. Uh, we have six submarines left, which is for Germans a strange number, as you might know. <laughs> the, the British <laughs> like that, by the way. We have six <laughs> submarines left. Only five, uh, five of them are not operational at the moment because of lack of funding uh, in the military services. Now, I said I'm not in the scaring business, and, um, and, and, and uh, I, I try to be optimistic. I think in many ways there are reasons to be optimistic when it comes to our field, and with that I mean uh, economics and finance, if we are realistic. Uh, and I try to give you some sense of optimism in my presentation. I know that is, uh, is not an easy thing, because when you look at the media and the way our field, or my field at least, is um, portrayed there, there's, uh, that we see lots of big lettered headlines which can frighten you, uh, which can frighten you um, as well. Um, I, I will not talk about these, the things that the gentlemen have talked about, because we will discuss, this, we will discuss about it. I will not talk about uh, Donald Trump. It's one of the few evenings uh, in this autumn where I'm not asked to talk about Donald Trump or say anything. Uh, my, my reason for being optimistic is actually um, is a look back into history, and I know, don't know whether you know what Winston Churchill has said about the Americans. Uh, Winston Churchill, who was um, um, war minister, British war minister in the First World War, um, prime minister in the second, and he said something like, you can count on the Americans that they will do the right thing, but only after they have exhausted all other opportunities. Um, so that's my sense of optimism uh, when I look at the Americans. Uh, so I will not go into trade war and these things. In a way, I will, because I will try to convince you that these headlines are uh, rubbish, useless, and should not, um, we should, should influence as political beings, but not in our assessment of the world economy. And I will do that with data. I know that's very old-fashioned to show data. Um, this is all fake news that I will be representing. Uh, you probably have read about the interview with Donald Trump. I didn't want to talk about him. I, I, I shouldn't, but, but I think it was last night he was interviewed, and he, he said, there are no tariffs. Who's talking about tariffs? We're not imposing any tariffs. <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway, um, so data don't matter. In my world, they do, and in yours as well. And I do believe in markets in general they matter, even though markets can be very irrational. Uh, I think I couldn't fulfill my role as an advisor, and previously I couldn't have fulfilled my role as a chief economist or as a head of... Um, a buy side research at a lot, very large private bank and the chairman of the investment committee of that bank if I wouldn't believe that in the end rationality would carry the day. So my first piece of data, is, uh, my first observation I'm going to make about what is going on in the world is that we are foolishly tempted by these media to believe that politics matter. Um, and I do think politics matter m much less than we think. They matter when it comes to things of war and peace. But they do not matter very much when it comes to trade policy and not even monetary policy. That's probably something that you, you, you guys uh, tend to think a lot about. And I do this, I dare to say this, when, because I like charts like this. This is a look at the US national income. So the only country where we have, well, it's hard to say reasonable data, we have some data. Uh, which is really long-term. It starts in the year 1800. And what I really like about the chart is that you don't see anything. Right. I think that's a very instructive chart. Um, you don't see politics with the exception of the Second World War. You see this little wiggling in the middle. of the, That's war. We see politics when it comes to war. But you don't see whether there was a Democrat or a Republican uh, at the helm. Um, you don't see any protectionist policies there. Uh, you don't see any impact of monetary policy at all on this. So when you do think long term, and I thought investment was partially about the long run, um, you can be reasonably relaxed that growth is a very strong process that is much stronger than politics. By the way, there's, there's something else that you don't see, and that's technology. Isn't that fascinating? And particularly in these days where ATH is constantly bombarding us with this digitization terror, I would call it, you know, and these calls to arms to support the Mint uh, faculties, which is absolute nonsense because <laughs> the Mint faculties and none of the new innovations we'll see will bring us better growth in the future. Right? This starts in 1800. Do you see any of the big technological waves there? 
Do you see the Industrial Revolution, for example? Most people say it started around 1820 to 1840 in the United States of America. Do you see the Industrial Revolution? Do you see the chemical industry, electricity, railways? Do you see the internet? Nothing, right? Man is a very curious, creative, inventive animal. And of course we will need technology. And of course technology will decide on whether the company that you work in or my companies that I have founded will survive, be successful, or will just go under. But if you look at it from a macro perspective for the country, the next technology will not bring us the next big growth spurt. So forget about that when you try to analyze the world. Um, if, you're, if you really have a sharp eye, you see something else in there. Um, you see next to these little wiggles that this is not a straight line. You know, I probably would have to go down here, and it, I can see it. It's not a straight line. It's getting slightly flat, even though it's a logarithmic scale, and all of you are trained in that, so you know what this means. This means that uh, the trend growth rate is actually uh, coming down. And that's a very natural phenomenon, and I don't know, I haven't really looked at the CFA economic schedule. I hope you are uh, familiar with basic growth theory, and you've learned that there is uh, something within the economic system that a situation where uh, the richer you are, the less fast you can grow. So there's diminishing returns um, to your investments that you actually make. Uh, if you look at productivity, um, that is what technology is going to show. Um, there is one relationship that is quite firm, and that is that the additional growth that productivity can bring diminishes with the level of average income in the society. So the more advanced, the more development your economy is, the more um, these um, uh, additions actually recede. That, that's actually very important for, a, for another remark I want to make. Trend growth, growth is coming down, not only because of demographics, for example, but also just because of a very simple growth engine uh, that we operate. My second observation is now more closer to home in the sense of finance. This is the real economy. This is real. This is volumes. This is production. This is cars. This is are things that you can count. Um, uh, the financial world is very often described as less real, uh, and, and people use this difference between the real economy and the other economy, which, which most of us actually work in. And I also see um, uh, an observation which, uh, which or there's also an observation that sometimes frightens me. Um, I do think people don't take their models very seriously. Um, when you look at the financial markets at the moment, um, um, well, not the last three weeks, um, but in, in very general terms, you might think that we are very rich. If you look at real estate prices, for example, you might think that uh, real estate prices are really high uh, and we are wealthy. But are we? Are we really? Uh, and I think sometimes think people have forgotten about basic, basic economics. We live in a world of zero interest rates. So how rich are we? What does this mean, zero interest rates? Basically means that every dollar you want to spend in the future, every Swiss franc, every pound sterling, everything you want to spend in the future, you either have to work for or you have to take out of existing assets because there's no return. Right. Isn't that a frightening thought? Have you thought about that? Um, it's, it's, this, it's this very old formula that all of, all of you, I'm sure, have learned. Is, is what is the value of a perpetual bond? Right? It's the one divided by the interest rate formula. It's the simplest, the only one I can remember in finance, actually. Um, it, it gives us the answer to, to the puzzle that we all think we're rich. We have these account statements, which are very bulky, and, and the banks make a lot of money off that because they charge fees in percentage terms on the assets under management. I think today we had a large bank which, talk, which um, uh, made some nice quarterly profit on it and created good news on it. But are we really rich? Well, well it's for sure we're not, right? Um, what has happened over the last 40 years or so? Interest rates have fallen. So if you take the value of anything which is a perpetual income stream, constant income stream, that value of the income stream has gone up, right? Assume you have one Swiss franc in terms of um, pension, and the interest rate 40 years ago was 10%. What was the value of that 
permanent income stream was 10, right? One divided by 0 0.10, which is one tenth or 10 percent, was 10. So you need to put, take 10 Swiss francs to put into a bank account to, at 10 percent, that gives you the one franc. That's, uh, you're all nodding and I'm boring you, I know. But it's easy to forget. It's the simple things which are sometimes very powerful, but they're very, very easy to forget. Now, in, the, in, in recent times, interest rates have fallen, right, from 10 to 1. So what is the value of, um, of this one Swiss franc pension you're receiving? 1 divided by 0 0.01. So that's 100. That's the ingenuity of this asset, assets, uh, asset management business model that you charge a percentage on, <laughs> on this, right? So the income of the banks and the asset managers ha has actually gone tenfold. Are we richer after that decrease in interest rates? Well, we have a bank account which says, or, or a, um, a portfolio which says uh, 100. But how much can we spend? We still only have one Swiss franc of pension, right? There is a huge illusion in our minds that uh, in a world where interest rates are very, very low, that we all feel very, very rich. Now you will say, um, but Klaus, wait, um, uh, you, you talk about a, f a fixed income stream and there's no growth in your model, right? And you're absolutely right, there's no growth in my model and I, I need to amend that with the growth rate of my income stream. But you know all about these models um, to understand um, that at least for some time, for 40 years now, we have had a period where the account statements were growing very, very fast um, and at interest rates at zero or very low, that growth will not repeat itself. Right? So whatever my future expectation for income from capital is, needs to be much lower than the last 40 years. Now you can look at the data. It's actually borne out very nicely. Always use US data. I don't know why. Maybe the theory is from the US and then it works out better. Um, uh, th uh, this is just what I described in words, right? You see in the yellow line is the corporate bond yield. I take a valuation of stocks here as an example. You see these two, 1960, it starts to, to, to the recent period. This is a corporate bond yield, pretty, pretty um, difficult stuff. Um, as published on the Federal Reserve Banks of St. Louis um, website. I should have put the source under it, my apologies. And you see these two periods where you have rising interest rates first up until 1980 roughly, and then you have falling interest rates. Um, these are the two trends. Will now, will interest rates fall further? It's, you know, your call, maybe they will fall again. Uh, probably they will fall again in the next recession, but we don't see that recession for the time being. Will they fall for another 40 years? I doubt it. My kids would say, I doubt it. Daddy, I doubt it, right? In Switzerland, it's very difficult to imagine that interest rates would fall further from these levels, even corporate bond yields. So what does this mean? This means that the performance of the blue line, that's the price index of the Standard Poor's 500, large, wide US stock index, um, uh, will probably not look like what it has looked like from 1980 onwards, which was fantastic, which give, instills all the hope that we have that asset management is a great business, right? Which, by the way, still drive a lot of expectations in asset allocation models when it comes to expected returns, because we have only well, significant data on a larger array of asset classes we only have out of that period where interest rates are falling. So most of our data is actually contaminated by that falling interest rate effect, but we never really care to think about it. Anyway, w what will it look like? Um, it will probably look like the oh, red line, right? Nominal GDP. Isn't that fascinating? Uh, I don't know, uh, Thomas, whether you've seen that before in your is that when you t take a long lens, suddenly macro things matter and, and actually actually work. I, I really find this interesting. So are we rich? Are we poor? I think we're much poorer than we think, even though we will have growth in our, in our um, earnings. We will have positive returns to some extent in some asset classes, but it will be much, much low, uh, less than we were um, used to. My third observation is really close to home. Uh, I mean, this is really close to home. It's right at the center of what most of us are doing. Um, and now I'll talk about asset allocation for a moment. And uh, I'll share an experience with you I had uh, in the year 2004, still working for my previous employer there. 
Uh, and we were asking ourselves in those days, um, so are we really good at what we're doing? Are we good at what, how do you measure that, whether you're good at what you're doing? No? We would say you, you, you have to have a benchmark. You measure yourself with a benchmark. But in asset allocation terms, what is the benchmark for the benchmark? It's a difficult question, right? What is the benchmark for the benchmark? And in those days, there was a bunch, uh, I think there was a, in those years, there was a new field of research coming up. And some people suggested, and I'm not claiming any, um, any originality here, it's everything stolen that you see in a moment. Um, they suggested, well, let's take as a benchmark what you would get if you were a really stupid investor. It's, not, it's a bit like the monkey throwing darts at the Wall Street Journal's um, page with all the stock prices. Um, so what, did, what does that mean? So how would a non-educated, well, probably still rash, reasonably rational investor invest? Non-educated means they have no clue what the returns <coughs> look like, whether stocks are better than bonds in the long run, uh, how they are correlated, or how you would match the asset classes into an asset allocation. So all that basic finance stuff that we are using to create these portfolios uh, would be uh, not available to that person. So what would that person do? Would take a uh, look, count the number of asset classes he or she has in front of her, and would put uh, equal amounts into each bucket, right? That's the naive asset allocation. You would take, put as much money as you, you would put into bonds, into stocks, and into real estate, into gold, and whatever you accept as an asset class. Well, well let's check. Let's see whether we can beat that benchmark. And uh, I first saw this picture, well, not this picture, but the very similar picture um, in the year 2004. And we, we compared strategy funds. That was my business. I was uh, on, the, on the buy side, if you want to. We compared strategy funds uh, performance uh, with this benchmark. And, and I've updated it a little bit for you. And this is what you would get. It's the average of the Swiss strategy funds, so don't, I'm not trying to pick on any bank or any asset manager. It's, and the average, actually, by the way, in the beginning, is, I think is only one, and then it's two and three relatively quickly, and now we have much more, obviously, in there. It's statistically, academically, probably a very difficult way of doing this, but as an illustrative uh, approach, I think it's kind of nice, and it's probably reliable. Uh, and you can see what the real outcome is after 28 years, uh, your investments would have been, would have advanced more if you had done what the stupid investor has done. Um, by the way, you would not have only had a better return, but also a lower volatility, as you probably can see from the chart. I find this a devastating observation for industry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, all of the things that I've been doing in my career, I mean, I started in, uh, to do applied economics in the year 1995 at Swiss Bank Corporation. So this is basically my career, what you see there. And, and actually, <laughs> in a large chunk of it, I was responsible for some of that nonsense, right? Um, all of that um, was not adding value, but was destroying value. My takeaway from this is finance needs to improve and I'm optimistic it can. But we can only if we dare to challenge the fundamental tenets that we hold. And sometimes we will be successful, I'm sure, um, sometimes we won't, but we have to be very honest because the clients that we service with, with these products, they're not stupid. They have understood this all the way, and it's one of the main reasons why they're so skeptical with the industry. It's not only bonuses and this bogus discussions we have in the media, it's the performance uh, that we actually have delivered in the industry. Now, how can you improve? You have to be extremely critical and I think the, um, and realistic. And I, I give you an example how difficult that can be. And, uh, and my example is, uh, is for me personally very difficult because I could not think, I cannot imagine a way how financial markets could work if they wouldn't work the way that finance postulates. Uh, and I'm talking about risk and return. I cannot in 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 envisage uh, a, an equilibrium world in which there is not a relationship between risk and return. So you take on higher risk, eventually you will be rewarded by higher returns. Eventually. Not every year, we know. Um, eventually. Um, if we are brutally honest and realistic and we look at data, um, we have to realize that 
this is a very, very difficult model in our minds. It's again strategy fund data I'm presenting to you. Risk and return, the way you are used to seeing the data. Uh, ten year periods, so the, the ten, so eight, 18 isn't done yet, so I had to take 17. So, so 8 to 17, 98 to 07, 88 to 97. Fascinating, right? And I'm not saying there's no relationship between risk and return, but over the last 20 years or so, or so it has grown very weak. Again, I cannot envisage how the world could work if th there was not that relationship. I'm too stupid. Maybe I'm just too stupid, and you, the young guys in the room, find a better way. And I would be very happy to sign up to your school, <coughs> listen to how you teach me to rethink this. But if you have to improve in the real world, what should you do or what is it that you should not do? I think the first conclusion that we have to draw from this is we shouldn't build business models around this. If we have clients that look at our results, at the way we service them, outside of a framework of 30 years. So if you have somebody, you know, in, over the 30 years it has worked, right? You can build averages, I don't need to do that for you. Um, so if, you have, if you're a life insurance company, maybe that's the right thing to think about the problem. But if you service private clients, I think that's a very dangerous business model. We have to rethink business models. Why is it dangerous? Because you have frustrated clients. You told them in the last 20 years or so, we told the clients, take on a little bit more risk and you get a little bit more return, right? Let's see how much risk you can take. Oh, you can take a little bit more, right? That's the way things work. It doesn't work. 20 years it didn't work. For 20 years it didn't work. So give me one bank in this country that doesn't have a value proposition in private banking built around this model and I give you seven out of eight banks within their marketing material who claim there is this relationship. And what happens with the clients? You believe, of course, you believe the expert. You believe your banker is a respectable person. <laughs> and next year, you'll be disappointed. The banker says, well, it is, you know, there's volatility and there's always a little bit of risk in the markets. And next year, you're disappointed. 10 years, you're disappointed. 15 years, you're disappointed. 20 years, you're disappointed. do you think these clients love you? Well, ask them. <laughs> Try to ask them. Um, I'm with a, a friend of mine have opened a little company which is called Swy Wealth Experts. You might want to check it out. We try to sit on the other side of, the, of this table. Um, we, we advise private clients to find good asset managers and, and asset managers that don't screw them in the process. Actually, the subsection of good asset manager and not screwing is actually relatively small. But they do exist. There are good asset managers which are fair with their clients. Um, it's funny, it's funny to listen to you guys, actually, when you sit there. Um, uh, you, come, you make a complete ass of yourself, but you don't <laughs> notice. There's one way of what you should not be doing, right? This is something that has to stop, otherwise the industry will never regain its credibility. Private, I'm talking about private wealth management, all of the other people in the room. One way of, of being honest and, and, and getting there. So my, my conclusions... In simple terms are this, we have to be realistic about growth, about financial returns, we have to rethink our value proposition. Have you tried and look into fintech solutions in the asset management side? What is built in there? You, know, you have these neat little things, you take your finger on the iPad and you increase risk and you turn. Forget that nonsense, it's not going to work. It's going to frustrate your clients even more because the lure of technology the credibility that these wonderful surfaces that you can work on actually brings with them uh, will give even higher and firmer expectations that what you promise, a higher return for taking on more risk, is a reasonable promise. And I tell you, it's a not a tenable promise, at least not in the short run. Re your business model and rethink your fintech solutions. Maybe it, to, to put it on a more, even more abstract level, I think what I've tried to, to tell to you or say to you is that what is going on? We have a problem of the elites, and I count all of you amongst them, telling stories which are not true. And when you think the populists are populist because they are using fake data, Use your data first before you go out and proclaim that you know how to make it. Thank you very much.